Welcome. Today we are going to introduce so-called Arsh and Garsh models, which have proven to be extremely powerful methodologies for estimating time-varying risk parameters. Remember the starting point. So the starting point is we have to estimate, for example, some variance parameters. Let's call it sigma t, variance sigma square t, variance a day t. Now, the variance daily is typically given by the average of squared returns over some uh, sample uh, of data. Now, what we've argued last time was that it's probably better to introduce a non-equality uh, weighting scheme in an attempt to recognize that the most recent observations should have a higher importance in the estimate compared to the oldest observation. And that's very important, especially when volatility is time varying. And last time we've argued, for example, in favor of the use of some weighting scheme that uh, was known as the exponentially weighted moving average uh, weighting scheme that had an exponential decay for uh, these weights as time goes by. Now, the Arsh model is some kind of a slight variation around the same methodology and the same concept. The only difference is we are going to be using some kind of long-term variance estimate as an anchor point. So let me call V of L the very, very long-term variance, which typically can be given, for example, uh, by the volatility or the variance estimate that you get over you know, the last 50 years, for example, or 20 years. So it's a very long-term estimate for variance. Let's assume that it's something like, you know, stock market volatility on the broad index is around 17, maybe 20%. So that's kind of, you know, a ballpark value for this uh, parameter. VL, 20% squared, because we're looking at the variance. So now what we're going to do is we're going to assign weights, not only to the most recent observations and to all the observations in the sample, but also some weight, gamma, to this long-term uh, average. And this is how we can kind of uh, improve the exponentially weighted moving average scheme by, again, anchoring the value uh, with respect to some kind of long-term meaningful estimate. Okay, that's the Arsh model. Let us now switch to the Garsh model. And the Garsh model is going to have a, a, an additional improvement over the Arsh model is in the sense that it's going to also have a weighted average of the last, the previous estimate for volatility. So let me take a very simple example, which is known as the Garsh 1-1, where I'm using as inputs the long-term volatility value, VL, and I'm, losing, I'm only using a single return, last return, yesterday's return, if you will, R of T. And then I'm also using as an input my last, my previous estimate for volatility, which I call sigma t minus 1. So these three inputs will be weighted with weights gamma, alpha, and beta, and the sum of these weights will be taken equal to 1. So in other words, my current estimate for volatility reflects the importance of the long-term value for volatility, also reflects the importance of the latest return, but also reflects the importance of my previous estimate for volatility. Now, the reason why it has been found useful to introduce previous estimate for volatility is because there's a phenomenon, an empirical regularity that we see when looking at time-varying uh, volatility uh, parameters, the time series of volatility parameters, is that there's some kind of clustering. So volatility doesn't move around in a totally erratic way. There are periods of high volatilities followed by periods of lower volatilities, and these periods tend to be clustered together. So by introducing last volatility estimate, we're kind of uh, introducing some kind of clustering effect, which is doing justice to the empirical regularity that we find in the data. So in this case, we're left with estimating three parameters, gamma, alpha, and beta, and we can be using some kind of statistical methods, such as the maximum likelihood methodology, which is embedded in any kind of decent statistical package that you may be using for implementing the Garsh model uh, methodology. Now, the general expression for the Garsh model methodology is the so-called Garsh PQ, 
where PQ tells you something about uh, the P is the number of data points that you're going to be using well, when looking at past returns in your volatility estimates. And Q is the number of lags that you're going to be using when looking at previous volatility estimates. So this is what you get as a PQ, uh, Garsh PQ estimator. In this case, you have to estimate P, alpha T parameters, to get estimate Q, beta uh, the parameters, which are the weights associated to the previous variance estimators. And then you get also one, let's call it omega value, which is kind of the influence, capturing the influence of the long-term variance. There actually are many different kinds and shapes of Gauss models and all kinds of variations around the Gauss models, but that's essentially you know, the most commonly used, the, the plain vanilla, if you will, expression for the Gauss model. Now, when should we be using Gauss models? Well, we should be using Gauss models in a situation where we have reasons to believe that these parameters are time varying. Well, if we put it this way, we should use it always because, you know, it is very frequently the case that these parameters are actually time varying. Now, if you're looking at the previous expression, what you understand is that for each variance parameter, for each risk parameter, we're introducing now P plus Q plus one new parameters, which are the parameters of the Gauss model that explain how volatility moves in time. So even if we take the simplest one, P is equal one, Q is equal one, well then we get three more parameters per variance parameters. So what we're seeing here is we are clearly increasing the curse of dimensionality dramatically in our attempt at addressing in a more meaningful way the curse of non-stationarity. Because we have three times more parameters. For each single risk parameter that we need to estimate, now we have three Garsh three parameters of the underlying Garsh model that we also need to estimate. In this context, it is commonly accepted that you should only use the Garsh model when the number of constituents is not too large, when the curse of dimensionality is not too severe. Otherwise, the increase in dimensionality uh, implied by the Garsh model will be uh, dramatic and will kind of overweight any benefits that you can expect from using the Garsh model. Now, if you're still looking at a fairly large number of uh, stocks, for example, and you're still concerned that volatility may be time varying, there are parsimonious ways to use Gauss model, something known as the factor Gauss, and even better, the orthogonal version of the factor Gauss that we tend to call the orthogonal Gauss model. Here is what it's looking like. What you're going to be doing is you're going to be going back to a factor model for explaining uh, covariance terms between two different uh, assets, and you're going to be using a factor model with uncorrelated or orthogonal factors, which is the reason why we call it the uh, OGARCH, orthogonal GARCH model. And what you're going to be uh, making as a simplifying assumption is you're going to be uh, simply allowing for time variation in the variance of the factors. So you're going to be using a Garsh model, but only for the variance of the factors, which will be much more parsimonious than using a Garsh model for the variance of each single individual stock, obviously. You could also potentially allow for time variation in the beta parameters as well, but that, of course, will be leading you to introduce a few more parameters. Let me wrap up. Uh, Garsh models are very convenient because they explicitly account for time variation in risk parameter estimates. The drawback though is that they uh, force you to uh, be estimating even more additional parameters. So you have to find a parsimonious way to deal with this type of situation. The most parsimonious way will be to use some kind of you know, uh, factor model and potentially an orthogonal factor model.